Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be an introduction to populations. So as always, let me get you some objectives and we'll get going. By the end of this video, three things that you should know or be able to do. First one is to describe each of the levels of complexity in the natural world. Second, explain each of the five characteristics of a population. And finally, discuss factors that influence population growth. So obviously today is all about populations. When we're talking about populations in environmental science, we need to talk about several levels of complexity. And this is basically like looking at all of the ways that the natural world is organized and each level is more complex than the next. So we're going to start all the way at the bottom and work our way up. The first level of complexity that you need to be aware of is right here, and that is the individual. Now, this is just going to be any individual in any ecosystem anywhere in the world. The major things to know about the individual level of complexity, excuse me, is this is the level at which survival and reproduction is super important. This is also the unit of natural selection. So when natural selection is working on the natural world, it is working on an individual. It isn't working on a population or an ecosystem. Natural selection selects for or against particular individuals. Now, if we want to move up and become a little more complex, we get to the population level. Population level is a group of animals that are the same species living in the same place at the same time. So right here we got this group of rabbits. They are all the same type of rabbit. They are living in the same forest at the same time. Now here's an interesting thing you need to know. Natural selection works on the individual, but evolution works on the population. So over time, populations will change in response to their environment, predation, things like that. As the population changes, the population is said to be evolving. So know that natural selection works on individuals, but evolution works on populations. Now, if you take several populations of different species and put them together, you have a community. At the community level, you are looking at interactions among species. So right here in this community, we've got our original rabbits. We have got a coyote who might be preying upon them. We have got grasses, we have got trees. Interactions between all of those different populations makes a community. If you take several communities and put them together, you have an ecosystem. And at the ecosystem level, the thing that we're primarily concerned with is the flow of energy and matter. So how much energy is coming in? What is the productivity of the ecosystem? How does carbon cycle through the whole thing? That would be the ecosystem level. And then take all of the ecosystems in the world and put them together and you have got the biosphere. At the biosphere, you are looking at broad global processes like love, uh, weather and ocean circulation and air currents and weather patterns and all that stuff. Um, note this word bio. Bio means living. So all the ecosystems together is the living component of our world. Rest of this video is going to be talking about populations in specific. So some things that we want to talk about. And the first is how do we describe change within a population? Um, the next set of slides is going to be five characteristics of a population. As we go through each of those characteristics, um, demographers, those are people who study populations, um, as they look at those five characteristics of a population, change in those characteristics will let them know broadly how a population is changing over time. So let's go ahead and talk about each of the characteristics of a population, starting with the size. Size, when we are talking about populations, is denoted by the letter N. So the total number of populations living, or sorry, not the total number of populations, this words are hard. The total number of individuals living in an area is denoted as a capital N. Um, scientists look at this factor to know essentially whether a population is healthy or not. An example of this is the California condor. 1980s, there was only about 22 of these individuals living in the wild. So scientists looked at that and said, oh, we've got a huge problem. So what they did is they went out, they captured all the condors, they started breeding them in captivity, and they released them back to the wild. And as of 2009, the California condor population was up to 300. So noting that the size of that population had significantly decreased gave scientists a clue that something was wrong so they could start doing something about it. The next characteristic we use to describe a population that you need to know about is the density. And the density of population is individuals per unit area. This is usually described as saying 
three individuals per square kilometer or per square mile. Um, it's talking about how many individuals are living in one well-defined piece of land. Now, obviously densities are going to vary widely based on the population. You could have a place like I don't know, Cheyenne, Wyoming, where you've got just a few people living in a square mile, or you could be in New York City where you've got like 10,000 people living in a square mile. So that is going to be an example of low density and high density. One thing that scientists can use density information for is to issue hunting permits. So wildlife management offers, officers might look at a broad area, could be a county, could be a national park. And as they look at that broad area, they're going to look at where there are dense numbers of animals that are being that can be hunted and less dense areas. And so they might divide that area up into sections and, in, and issue a different number of hunting permits based on each section. So if an area has got a high density of individuals that can be hunted, the manager might issue several permits for that area. And if another area has got a low density of huntable individuals, then the manager would issue a low number of permits for that area. The next quality that you need to know about is the distribution, and there are three basic population distribution patterns. There is random distribution, there is uniform distribution, and there is clumped distribution. Now, in a random distribution pattern, you will see individuals scattered throughout an area without any particular rhyme or reason. They are just kind of all over the place. An example of this is a lot of plant species because their seeds are carried on the wind. so they grow wherever the wind drops them. There is also a uniform distribution in which all animals live just about the same distance from one another. This sort of distribution is seen in animals that are territorial because this animal right here, he will defend the territory around him. This one will do the same this one will do the same. So basically by these animals defending their territories, there is an even distribution of them across the area. And then there is a clumped distribution pattern. In a clumped distribution pattern, individuals live together in particular areas. And I've got this map of America up here because humans generally show a clumped distribution pattern. We settle and colonize around resources. So up here, Initially, you had resources like ports for shipping, so people started colonizing in that area, and then it switched to where like New York was a cultural and business place to be, so people started living there. So humans live where resources are, and sometimes those resources are natural resources like water and food. Other times they are natural or are human resources like people and thoughts and ideas. So humans exhibit a clumped distribution pattern couple things left. You've got the sex ratio. Sex ratio is basically how many males there are for every female or how many females there are for every male. Most populations will show a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning that for every one male there's one female, but other populations may show a skew in that ratio. Um, the number of females in a population can give clues about future generations, basically how big they are. If you've got lots of females in one generation, then the next generation might be larger because each of those females is going to be, ha be able to have children. If you have fewer females, then your population is probably going to grow more slowly because there are fewer women to have children. And we express um, sex ratios and other characteristics of a population through age structure diagrams. And an age structure diagram is what you see there on the right. Now, note that if I were to scoot that diagram over, it would look like a pyramid. What they do is they divide the population in half. In this case, you've got women as the blue bars on the left, men as the green bars on the right, and then they give age range categories. So the bottom bar is for individuals in the population that are 0 to 4, the next one up is 5 to 9, the next one up is 10 to 14, and the bar represents what proportion of your population for that sex falls into that age category. Age structure diagrams basically break populations down and they can give us clues about whether populations are going to grow, if they're going to shrink, how healthy they are. Um, one thing that can easily be told from an age structure diagram is if it looks like this, like a pyramid, and the base of the pyramid is very big, that means that this population is probably going to grow rapidly in the future because most of the population has not yet started having children. A couple things left. We're going to wrap up with factors that influence the growth of a population. Now, as far as basically calculating the growth of a population, here's how you would do it. Births 
plus immigration. Immigration with an I means individuals that are moving to an area. So this would be your input into the population, births and immigrations. Subtract from that deaths and immigration with an E. Immigration with an E is people moving out of an area. So if you take people being added to the area, the inputs, that would be birth and immigration, subtract, or sorry, birth and immigration are your inputs, subtract your outputs, death and immigration with an E, that will tell you your growth, your population and growth. So that's an equation to keep in mind. We'll use it quite a bit throughout the year. And two final things. Um, there are two broad categories of factors that regulate the growth of a population. There are density dependent factors and density independent factors. Density dependent factors are denoted as K. And these are factors that regulate populations based on the size and the density of a population. These are things that are more likely to kill an individual if there are more individuals living together. So examples of this would be food. If you've got only a few individuals living together, then the population isn't under any stress or pressure. There is plenty of food to go around. But if you've got lots of individuals living in an area, there is not very much food to go around. And the amount of food limits the uh, number of individuals. Same can be said for shelter. The same can be said for nutrients. On the same can be said for water. Disease is another example of a density dependent factor because diseases spread more easily and kill more easily when there are lots of individuals living together in a population. And one thing that is used to describe the density um, dependence limiting factor of a population is carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is basically the maximum population as determined by resources. So this carrying capacity is the line that a population cannot cross. Um, whatever the limiting resource is in an area, whether it be food or water, um, this is the resource that runs out first. The limiting resource is basically what determines how many individuals can live in an area, and that level is known as the carrying capacity. And final thing for the day, is density independent factors. These are factors that limit the size of a population regardless of how many um, individuals are living together. The best example of these are natural disasters like tornadoes and hurricanes and typhoons and earthquakes because that tornado is going to happen regardless of whether there are a hundred thousand people. Forgive the light out. Man, that seems to happen a lot recently. Um, that tornado is going to um, happen whether there are 100,000 people in the way or 5,000 people in the way. So this thing is going to go through and do its damage regardless of how many people are living in an area or how many animals are living in an area. So that's it. That's your introduction to populations for the day. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. We'll see you again.